Hi, everybody. Um, we're very happy to hear, have you all here tonight, um, especially since we know at UT Dallas this is the time of year when everybody starts to get into their corners of quiet midterm desperation. Um, so we're glad you made the healthier choice and actually coming here and being out in public with us all tonight instead. Um, some of you know me and I can see who's getting extra credit and who isn't already. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm Professor Gossin. I teach uh, inter uh, interdisciplinary literature and science courses and history of science courses and courses in the Great Plains, uh, literature and culture, but I'm very, very lucky this semester to get to be co-teaching with this guy right here, Dr. Mark Hairston, who's a research physicist at the Hansen Center for Space Sciences, and we are teaching a special section of literature, 3311, which is usually devoted to some form of science fiction and fantasy, and this semester we are completely devoting it to an exploration of the anime and manga of Hayao Miyazaki. So that's why we get to have this particular spe special guest speaker tonight. Um, I also need to make sure that I acknowledge the people who have made this visit possible. And um, we feel very, very grateful to Dr. Tom Linehan of the ATEC program, who is responsible for sponsoring our guest speaker's visit here this week. Um, he immediately saw the potential um, for creative exchange and positive social and intellectual energy when Dr. Harrison and I proposed bringing uh, Dr. Condry here. So we're very, very grateful to them, and I think we'd take a moment to thank them. Um, it's not very often that we get to have somebody who can actually engage arts and humanities, uh, arts and technology, the sciences, engineering, Japanese language and culture all in one talk, but that's what we're going to get to have tonight. And Dr. Hairston is going to be introducing our guest speaker to you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure to be up here introducing Dr. Ian Condry, and I get to do a little bio, and he's a classical example of someone who made one seemingly insignificant life choice, but ended up determining what happened with the rest of his life. He grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca, attended Harvard, that wasn't the small choice, although that was not bad either, got his, <laughs> got his BA in government in 1987, and Harvard requires a, a, a language, and since he was terrible at Spanish and couldn't pass the test there, he decided he'd do something easier, he'd learn Japanese. <laughs> So, it, you know, again, this is, this is the little difference. It's like, okay, this sounds fun. He had a great teacher, fell in love with it. And as a result of this, after he graduated, uh, well, you, you did a homestay over there for a year while you were an undergraduate in Japan. Afterwards, he went over working with the JET program. This is the program where you go teach for a year, teach English in a Japanese school or two years, whatever, work there came back to the U.S. His original plan was he wanted to be a journalist, so he was working for Japanese newspapers in the U.S. out of Washington, D.C., and his assignment, he said, was to go uh, interview academics, you know, to get quotes from them to, that would then run in the Japanese papers, uh, and what he discovered was that the academics knew a lot of cool stuff, and he finally decided being an academic is a whole lot more interesting than being a journalist. <laughs> so he went back to Yale, got his PhD in anthropology, um, yeah, in anthropology in, I've got, lost the year here, 99, was that That's right? right? Yeah, 99. Yeah. Um, and then uh, went to MIT in 2003, did I get, yeah, got the 2003. He's now the associate professor of media and cultural studies there. His specialty is the study, I, now I get to read this exactly so I get it straight, <laughs> study of media and popular culture and how creative communities offer new possibilities for education, the arts, global health, business, and political partic participation. Since January of 2006, he has been organizing the research program, the MIT Harvard Cool Japan Project. <laughs> I wish we had a Cool Japan Project here. Anyway, this project involves colloquia, cultural performances, and international conferences to examine the cultural connections, dangerous distortions, and critical potentials of popular culture. So, for his book, uh, it, for those of you that are in the class, obviously you know you've been reading his, his book, his book, The Soul of Anime, that came out earlier this year. He spent several months, years, however long, you want to count it, in Japan right. actually working with the various studios, observing and then looking to see how these organizations, these collaborative groups come together and whatever that soul, that magic, that dark energy, whatever it is, comes together to ultimately create the animation that you watch on your TVs and your laptops. So without any further ado, Dr. Ian Condry.
house oh. button. Okay. It's right back yeah. in here. House button is what we need. Let's turn that off and see if we can get the lights a little bit better here. Yeah, that's a little better. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, lovely introduction. Thank you, Pam, for having me. It's my first trip to Dallas uh, and Richardson. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, this is a center, actually, of animation uh, excitement with Funimation uh, not far away and also Anime Fest uh, right here uh, in the neighborhood. So uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about my research, uh, try to talk about some of the issues uh, that arise in the book, uh, about 50 minutes I'm aiming for, and then we'll have a chance for questions afterwards. Uh, you're also welcome to ask, uh, raise your hand and ask questions as we're going along. Uh, I'm flexible on that. Um, uh, but without further ado, uh, let's get started. Um, this is the book. I'm very excited about it. Uh, the Soul of Anime, uh, Collaborative Creativity. Uh, thank you for using it in the class. <laughs> I'm delighted. You're probably the first class to use it, so uh, uh, I'm curious to hear how it goes. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, read it yet or looked at it, you can download the, uh, the first uh, chapter uh, for free, uh, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, I might mention as well that the book is published under a Creative Commons license. Uh, which means that uh, it's a special copyright licensing scheme so that if you want to copy it and give it to your friends, that's okay. Uh, the publisher says that's okay, I say it's okay, uh, and it's part of an ongoing uh, group of people trying to rethink how copyright might work. Um, so anyway, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the ideas in this book, uh, and we can talk about other things as well. Uh, the questions, uh, you're welcome to ask anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be just related to the things I'm saying. All right, let me paint some of the big picture to begin with. This is a book about Japanese animation, right? It's about cartoons. Uh, but my goal is somewhat bigger, uh, at least my interest in looking at cultural movements that go global has a broader uh, kind of emphasis than simply saying, let's interpret Japanese anime, say what's so great about it. I do think Japanese anime is great. Uh, I think interpreting it is also a great exercise. But it seems to me there might be other lessons as well. Because as I look around the world, look around America today, look at Japan, uh, we're facing big problems. Right? There's concerns about the direction our economy is going, questions about whether our governmental leaders are able to lead and to tackle the problems that are all around us. It's a strange time when we recognize things like global warming, the challenges of labor problems uh, around the world. Uh, the question of whether there will be jobs in the future uh, for advanced economies like the U.S. and Japan uh, and where those jobs might come from. And it seems to me that these are kinds of things that we're all concerned about and we're waiting for a kind of leadership at the top. We're waiting for some new ideas. We're waiting for a conversation uh, about how the economy can be transformed in an era beyond the Industrial Revolution. Right? If manufacturing jobs are clearly going uh, to countries outside the U.S., like China uh, and elsewhere, Bangladesh. Uh, I worry that some of those jobs are not coming back and that we need uh, some new ideas about where uh, jobs of the future can come from. Uh, and I, I use this picture because in some ways I feel like we're caught in the grip, right? In the grip of a system that's not working entirely for us. Uh, and it may seem like Japanese cartoons are a strange place to look for answers uh, to these kind of problems, but I, I think uh, there's the hints of them there. Uh, and I want to suggest uh, some of the ways of thinking about it. And when I'm talking about a kind of crisis in capitalism, a crisis in the economy, I mean, just to give a little more uh, sense of it, I mean, one of the things we all know, right, is the rising inequality, uh, income inequality in the U.S. These are the kind of graphs we've seen around, right, how the top 1% uh, share of wealth in the United States has grown phenomenally. Uh, and I do think this is a question uh, that reaches beyond uh, red and blue states, right? I'm coming from blue state uh, Massachusetts, coming down to red state Texas. I think this is a problem that we both share. Uh, uh, we may differ on, on how we solve this problem, but we can agree uh, there's a problem out there. Uh, and and it continues to grow. Uh, and also, you know, even although my devotion to blue state politics gets a pause when I look at a graph like this and see that this line of income inequality hasn't changed that much regardless of whether it's a blue president or a red president uh, in the White House. 
Uh, and it makes me think that there's broader systemic problems uh, in how we think about what the economy is and what's the relationship between our understanding of the economy and how the economy unfolds. You know, this is a kind of interesting uh, graph here, uh, thinking about what is the income distribution in the U.S. It's maybe a little hard to read, uh, but what these graphs are is what the actual distribution of wealth is by quintile, right, by one-fifth of the population. Uh, the actual distribution, you can see, uh, the top 20% of Americans own more than 80% of the wealth, and the rest are squeezed down, and the bottom 40% are barely visible on the, uh, on the graph. Now, what's also interesting about this kind of image, though, is what Americans think it is, that if you ask us, me, to guess what the income distribution is, we get a graph like the middle line. Not even close, really. And what people think it should be would be the bottom graph there as well. What this suggests is that not only is our economy not really serving the interests of at least 80% uh, of Americans, but we're not even thinking of the right model of the economy when we're doing it. We don't even have the right image, perhaps, of how the economy works. And this is where I think the study of media is so interesting. Because what media has shown, especially in recent years, is that we're entering a new era of productivity, of connectivity, uh, of social networking that's creating new forms of production. Right? Imagine 20 years ago if we went to Encyclopedia Britannica and said, I got an idea. Instead of hiring people and making an encyclopedia with experts, we're going to make a website. <laughs> right? We're going to let anybody contribute to this website. The people at Encyclopedia Britannica would say, that's crazy. You can't make a website like, you can't make an encyclopedia like that. You need experts. You need to pay them. You need editors uh, to go in and be professional uh, in order to make a project like this work. It's not true, it turns out. But we wouldn't have known it's not true until we see these new examples, until we recognize them as offering alternative forms of creativity and productivity. This is the space of media today. Media is not just uh, content for consumption. Media is a space for us to interact connect up, and maybe find new ways to produce things, new kinds of organizational structures, basically inventing something out of nothing. But of course, it's not invented out of nothing. It's just invented out of something that's not easily measured in economic terms. I would argue it's easily measured in social terms. And in fact, that this is very much the story of how animation itself began. I want to jump back 100 years. Windsor McKay is a cartoonist for the New York Herald, famous cartoonist. Uh, ca comic strips were becoming increasingly popular uh, as a means to sell newspapers uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Windsor McKay was one of the leaders in this group. Film is also becoming more popular at this time. Windsor McKay says, I'm going to make my characters move by using this new technology of film. And he proposes this. In fact, he makes a movie uh, proposing this uh, to his friends. They're sitting around a gentleman's club. He's got artist friends around. They also are cartoonists or illustrators. And he says, I'm going to make my characters move. In one month's time, I will write, draw 4,000 pictures uh, and make my characters dance. This is what his artist friends thought of his idea. <laughs> they said, you're crazy, Windsor. That's not possible. That's not going to work. Uh, there's no way you could possibly pull that off. Windsor McKay says, nope, there he is with uh, the, on the, the far right-hand side here. He says, nope, I'm going to do it. You watch. Uh, and so in this movie, he makes a movie dramatizing um, this, uh, this process. He's got stacks of paper, barrels of ink, uh, a flip book type mechanism that allows him to see how the drawings are progressing, that he can fit in new drawings and old drawings. Uh, it also shows the kind of disastrous mistakes that can happen uh, in the course of trying to make animation. But after a month's time, he succeeds and he makes an animation. And let me just show a short clip of what it ends up looking like.
So here's the idea I would like to start with. Would Windsor McKay have had the energy uh, and the motivation uh, to carry through a project like this were it not for the thought of his friends who were waiting for him, that he had somebody to show it to? This is what I want to suggest, is that the great innovations uh, of our time may not start with a great business model. They may not even start with a good idea. But they start with a group of people who care about something. And maybe uh, some inspired individual who wants to work with that group and show them that it's possible. There was no business model for animation in these early days. Uh, but what there was were some people who cared about it and wanted to make it happen. I'm calling this a kind of collaborative creativity. A way of thinking about creativity not as coming from the minds of geniuses, uh, but a, coming from a kind of community of interest, a community of shared practice, uh, a community of people uh, who want to work together on solving some kind of problem. Because it seems to me that this, in fact, was the origin of animation, uh, not just here. There's a lot of debate about where animation actually began in the history. It can be traced back hundreds, even a thousand years. Uh, but nevertheless, the idea that it was not about making money at first. So that our idea that in trying to find solutions to the, our global problems should start with a great new business model might be off to a wrong start right from the beginning. That maybe we should be thinking about the kinds of groups, the kinds of networks, the kinds of mixtures of ideas that might offer new possibilities uh, for imagining different kinds of organizations, different kinds of creativity. Now this is a theme that comes up in a variety of works. Uh, one of my favorite uh, anime directors, uh, by the name of Mamoru Hosoda, uh, explores this in his films. Uh, he thinks about the ways that media networking today is creating new kinds of collaborations. Right? Summer Wars uh, is about the virtual world, uh, where our ability to interact, do business, communicate, play games online, uh, is both a great opportunity but also scary and potentially dangerous if that world gets corrupted. There are ideas about the way in which uh, we have to come together and share uh, our resources in order to make these things happen, uh, but by the same token, the ways that this networking uh, can lead to a kind of dangerous takeover uh, by evil forces that might populate these worlds. This, if this is a vision in Summer Wars of a kind of hero that is not a single person, but a hero that is an entire family, and even a network that reaches beyond that family. Uh, Hosoda has another kind of film uh, called The Girl Who Leapt Through Time that takes a somewhat different view, inspired by a different aspect of media change, which is that as we have more and more access to media, we also get more, more and more personalized selections of what that media might be. Right? This is sometimes talked of as the filter bubble, Right? It's kind of a negative idea that we only live in our own kind of bubble of information and that we don't get enough wider differences of opinion out there uh, to help us understand the world as it might be. Hosoda portrays this uh, by changing this original story. In the original story of the girl who leapt through time, a boy from the future comes to our present. Uh, in the original story, he comes to our present to collect plants, plants that can be used to make medicines. Um, a kind of a solution that thinks about society as a whole. And Holstead has said, you know, that's interesting, but it doesn't fit with today's world. He said, for today's kids, he says, he imagines, thinking of the cell phone generation, uh, that they're not going to be the ones who want to save society as a whole. When they think about the future, they think about a personal future, about my future, and how my future might be. And he says, if that's the case, then the boy from the future uh, is not going to come uh, in order to save society as a whole. He's going to come to solve some kind of trauma in his own heart. So in this movie, the boy comes, uh-oh, what happened here? <laughs> Crisis. That's not so good. Uh, I probably just pushed the wrong button. I'm trying to, let's see if that works. That's Wolf Show, and we'll get there in just a second. Uh, a kind of personalized future uh, that speaks to this, and that the boy comes back to see this painting uh, in order to overcome the horror of his own time. Holstead has yet another film, right? his newest film, Wolf Children, uh, soon to be released by our very own Dallas-centered uh, Funimation, uh, coming out uh, November 26th. Uh, and I'm told there's even a, uh, a special competition that if you go to tug, uh, tug.com, 
you can request to have wolf children screened in your area if you can get a group of people together. It's a very interesting kind of model. It's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about for imagining a kind of bottom-up way of, of thinking about the economy, thinking about our participation uh, in making things happen. Uh, anyway, it's a wonderful film, uh, fascinating. Here's Hosoda uh, along with the producer uh, Saito. It's Hosoda on the left. Um, very interesting film. Uh, that looks at the drama of being a single mom, uh, a single mom with kids who don't fit in uh, to the regular model of what society expects. Now, I bring up these examples from Hosoda uh, because this is a common way of talking about animation. Uh, you start with the story. You tell the story of a film, you fit it into an argument uh, about how society is changing, what it can say about media, about identity, technology, gender, sexuality. There's lots of things that we can talk about with Japanese animation, and it's one of the things that makes it so fascinating and such an expansive world. But as Mark mentioned, Dr. Hairston, I should say, as Dr. Hairston mentioned, uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist. And frankly, I didn't know what cultural anthropology was when I was in, uh, an undergraduate. Uh, I learned later. But one of the things about cultural anthropology, it's the study of contemporary cultures anywhere in the world. But there's a method associated with it. And that method, that research method, uh, is one of participant observation, doing field work, being among the people you're studying, and trying to tell the story of what the world looks like from their point of view. So when I think of the film Wolf Children, uh, I think of the places where the animators work. I think of the spaces where Wolf Children was actually made. And in case you're curious, this was it. <laughs> it's the third floor of this building above a small convenience store, a kombini, uh, there in western Tokyo. Uh, and if you go inside, this is what Wolf Children looks like to the creators. <laughs> stacks and stacks of paper, right, by scenes and cuts, uh, all stacked up. And this was about uh, a week before the film came out. I had, was fortunate enough to be able to visit uh, with Hosoda and see the studio. And he said, it was good timing, because they're about to throw all these out uh, and, and burn them, uh, which is kind of, uh, kind of heartbreaking, right? For those of us anime fans, I've talked to the studios about this. Why do you do this? All of us would love uh, to get some of this work. It would be a, a way of promoting the film. Why not? You, you're not making very much money anyway, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Why not do this? Uh, and it's interesting, because it also points to sort of the culture of being an artist. One of the things they say is, this work is not made for public consumption. We're putting out what's made for public consumption. Uh, this is the working stuff, and we don't want it seen. Uh, and it kind of speaks to, I guess, they would say the integrity uh, of being an artist, uh, as much as it might hurt us uh, as, uh, as fans. So this comes to sort of one of the big ideas that I want to talk about. Uh, the idea that there's something social in media, uh, and it seems to me that there's a split in the way we think about media. Uh, and it's not one or the other. It's not even necessarily a historical shift. But I think originally, there was more of an idea of media as content, right? That there's a boundary between producer and fan. Media is something packaged, published, consumed, right? There's objects that we can point to and say, OK, this is media, the media of the book, the media of the DVD, the CD, the CD even the MP3. There's a way of thinking about the politics of media if media is content, right? It's about propaganda. Who gets to broadcast information? Uh, literacy, are there better ways to read the media that's out there? But it seems to me with some of this new technology, uh, we're increasingly becoming aware of a notion of media as a platform, right? Where this is more about the social aspects of media rather than about the kind of content uh, that media conveys, right? And here, the discussion is more about participatory spaces. Right? Facebook, we all know, but there's dozens of those, right? from Instagram on down. Communities of shared interests. This becomes the kind of the key word, rather than the professionalization of media producers. Um, and a kind of idea of crowdsourced production, which relates to a whole range of different kinds of new forms of production of media. Uh, and also a different way of thinking about the politics of it. Echo chambers, uh, filter bubbles, uh, and the ways that collaboration might offer new possibilities. And it seems to me that this gets us to rethink, well, what is of value in media? What is exchanged uh, as we upload something, as we put a blog post on, as we comment on other people's blog posts? These are not things easily measured in economic terms, but I would say they are vitally important 
uh, to the success or failure of these kinds of platforms. Uh, and they point to this new meaning of network as well. When I was growing up, a network was ABC, CBS, or NBC. <laughs> uh, and now a network can be all sorts of other things as well. Okay? And it seems to me that this kind of the social in media uh, may be a place to look for thinking about new forms of production, new forms of creativity, new possibilities for collaboration. Success is a key word I use in the book as well. What are we talking about when we talk about anime success? 60% right, of the world's TV cartoons broadcasts are Japanese. Uh, this is actually a number I'm not very confident about. <laughs> I don't let on in the book very much, uh, but I'm not sure how true this is. The one thing I do know is I visited Cartoon Network Studios in Burbank, California, just outside of LA. And uh, I asked the head of the studio there, I'm like, you know, I, they say that 60% of TV cartoons are Japanese worldwide. Do you think? He's like, yeah, you know, that sounds about right. Uh, so I'm like, OK, we're going with it. Uh, <laughs> uh, beyond that, I'm not sure. But I do think it's true that that may not be true in the US. But worldwide, I do think there's a lot more Japanese cartoons out there, uh, in part because they're made more cheaply. And I'll discuss that in just a moment. Other aspects of the success, quite interesting, is a $2 billion a year business if you add up TV commercials, theater box office, and DVD sales. But it's a $19 billion a year business if you talk about licensed merchandise. And this starts to get interesting, that what anime actually makes is not so much anime as characters that can be spun off uh, into other kinds of merchandise. Again, kind of interesting aspect that takes us beyond the content of a media form itself to thinking about the movement across media forms. Okay? Based on successful manga, that's also true. And the importance of fan conventions and fan production uh, is very important. So in one of the meanings of collaborative creativity that I use in my book, is to say that anime's success depends on this connection with manga, Japanese comic books, anime, toys, and fans as well. There's other ways to think about success. Uh, the great Hayao Miyazaki, who may or may not be uh, retiring soon. <laughs> <laughs> he says he is, but he, says he, is, but he said he is before, uh, so we're going to find out. This was his biggest grossing film. Uh, I'm sure many, if not most of you, have seen it. Spectacular imagery that's really etched in the minds of people around the world. Uh, but of course, there's other examples of Miyazaki's brilliance. Uh, iconic images uh, that will no doubt last for decades. But of course, anime is much more uh, than just Miyazaki. Uh, it was more the sci-fi stream that made some of the first inroads uh, in the United States uh, with films like this. Uh, and of course, today, uh, a much more wide variety uh, of styles from high school host clubs uh, to ninja uh, uh, and so on. When I started this project, right, I started this long uh, transition in part because students in my classes were talking more and more about anime. I'd say, why are you taking my class in Japanese culture? And I'd go around the room and say, anime, 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 manga, manga, anime, anime, <laughs> you know, karate. There'd always be like one karate guy. <laughs> <laughs> Ikebana, you know, I don't know. It would be one other thing, but most, I was like, wow, you know, this is really something. Something about anime is happening, and I had seen some of the anime, but I was more of a music guy, right? My first book was on hip-hop in Japan, uh, uh, and so that, you know, that, I, I liked anime, but I wasn't, I didn't know that much about it, but I said, okay, I'm going to study this, and I'm going to, I'm going to figure out the secret of anime's global success. I'm going to package it as a little kind of business plan. Here will be like the 10 ways, 10 things you can learn in anime. I'm going to be a consultant, and I'm going to get rich. As I thought, you know. I'm going to get rich, rich, rich. I mean, I like teaching and all, but I also like the idea of being rich. Uh, and so uh, I, I thought, okay, this could be what I do. So I, I start, I go to Japan, and I start checking out the anime studios. Um, and the first thing I realize, no one gets rich making anime. <laughs> it wasn't going to work at all. Uh, my business plan was a complete failure. I was going to have to stick with my day job, uh, and that was okay. Uh, but what made it interesting, actually, I said, oh, wait, that, this is even kind of more interesting. How is it that a media form that doesn't make money become a global phenomenon? And again, this becomes the puzzle, right? A hundred years ago, there was no such thing as anime. Thirty years ago, the Japanese government never would have thought of anime as something that they might export as something that could be a driver. Uh, of cultural power uh, from Japan. But something happened, right? Some people did understand this. Some people pushed this. People like Hayao Miyazaki, 
right? People like the fans who appreciated Hayao Miyazaki, not only in Japan, but around the world. That these kind of people were the ones who kept driving anime and led it to the place it was today. Uh, and it also meant that people like this who were working away for fairly low pay uh, in very difficult working conditions did it not only because they made enough money to get by, and that was enough, but there was a kind of satisfaction of being part of a project that is bigger than yourself. Uh, and it seems to me that if we think about that, then it helps remind us that we need a different understanding of value, of way to understand value beyond gross domestic product. We need ways of thinking about the social value of what we do. I think people should be paid a living wage. Uh, I also think that we should have jobs that are meaningful. I also think those jobs are out there. There's plenty of things to be done in this world. There's plenty of people who want to do things to make the world a better place. But we have a matching problem right now, a connectivity problem. And it seems to me one of the things that new media do so well is connect up people. Uh, and that's why I think media studies is a way for us to think about the transformation of politics and capitalism. Because here is a standard view of the value of Japanese animation. I'm sorry for those who don't read Japanese. I'll just explain quickly. But this is that $2 billion graph. This is the value of animation through the years. You really can't see it at all. Uh, but it starts in 1973. It really picks up in 1990. Goes up to about 2008 here. That's about $2 billion. It's written in yen. Uh, but it comes out to about $2 billion. Um, and this is sort of the value of anime, the value of the production, the value of the money that is spent, either on TV commercials, DVDs, or theater tickets. But I want to suggest there's a different understanding of value, an understanding of value that we actually live by much more than these kinds of graphs that fill our business pages of the newspaper. And to get at that, um, I propose thinking about one of my favorite anime. <laughs> Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei. OK, so long, Mr. Despair. Uh, some of you probably know uh, a little bit about this. It's based on a gag manga. Uh, it's the story of this, uh, this sensei, uh, Nozomu Itoshiki. Uh, he writes his name like that. It almost sounds like a Japanese name. Uh, it's pretty close. Nozomu is certainly a Japanese name. Itoshiki is a little weird, uh, but, but I suppose it's conceivable. But if you write it a different way, it's read Zetsubo or Despair. Uh, and that's the shtick about this show, is this teacher who I can really relate to despairs about the problems in society, looks around and sees nothing but disaster, uh, misinformation, and misunderstanding. Um, I feel like I had teachers like this, actually. <laughs> might, might be why I became a teacher. I'm not sure. Uh, but it's interesting because he spends, he, it's the day, I want to show a short scene here that gives us a way of rethinking value. Okay, rethinking value beyond our productivity. Uh, it's a day in the school of the student examinations. Uh, they actually do this in, in Japanese schools, where uh, one day a year, uh, they measure your height, your weight. OK, you can handle that. But they all start measuring your bust, your hips, your waist, the whole thing. Uh, as you can imagine, this is bad enough at any time. But in high school, boy, uh, what an anxiety-provoking day. Uh, and Mr. Despair says, this is no way to understand who you are. This is no way to think about what your value is. I've got a new idea. Uh, for how to think about your value. Uh, and so this is it. Let's see if I can get this to work here. ブログのアクセス数とか、参考文の発行部数とか、上田数字は適期に一周するから、日本はおかしなことになるんです。絶望した身体測定社会に絶望した大切なのは中身がどうかということでしょう。そんなわけ、今日は身の丈測定を実施
、ワンスポンジです。そんなわけで、皆さんの色だけをわかります。用意した部屋に一人ずつ入ってきてください。失礼しますどうぞおかけくださいあはいどうぞ突然で悪いんですけど1万円貸してくれませんか<笑>お願いできませんか無理ですよ1万円はじゃあ2000円でいいです<笑>貸してくれませんか嫌ですよ2000円もじゃあ1000円1000円は大金ですよ五百円。五百円はな。百円。百円と言ってもいい。五十円。あ、えっと、わかりました。それくらいなら貸します。五十円。え？君の人間の器は五十円です。<笑>そうですね。具体的に言うと、五十円の人間は、貸したシャーペンについている消しゴムを使ってからマジで、降りる駅を過ぎても、百六十円区間ギリギリまで降りると期待し、キャンプで自分の携帯を使わず、他人の携帯を借りて当たりに使う。そんな人にあなたはなりたい。なりたくありませんし、そんなことしません。とにかく、五十円の君には、身の丈に合った生活をしていただきます。Oh, poor Osui Kage. Yeah, well,、uh, it's not, it doesn't say so bad for this guy, so we don't have to feel too bad for him.、Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff、uh, going on in this clip,、uh, but I just want to focus on one idea and thinking about alternative approaches to understanding value.、Uh, and that is that I think, and I would argue, that in our everyday lives, when we're assessing other people、uh, and their value, Uh, and what we think about them, that we're much more interested not in how much money they have, but how much they're willing to share with us. right? How generous is this person? And that doesn't have to be a generosity associated only with money.、Uh, it might not only, in fact, it might even, probably not primarily associated with money. In fact, that's what makes this scene so funny.、Uh, but it's a kind of generosity of spirit. Right? A generosity, a social generosity、uh, that matters to us in our everyday lives. I would say this is actually where we live. We don't live in a world of the business pages of the newspaper. We live in a world like this, where what matters is what's on the inside and how that person will relate to us、uh, as a human being. And I think this is another example of the ways、uh, that we have a distorted image of what makes the world run. We may have a distorted image of where new forms of value can come from.、Uh, and I think this kind of thing reminds us、uh, not to get sucked up、uh, into the, the ordinary ways of thinking about political power, the ordinary ways of thinking about economic power, and start focusing as well, not that those things aren't important, but they underplay、uh, the importance of social dynamics that are much more important for the world that we actually live in day to day. Okay, and I'm not the only one、uh, talking about this. There's other people thinking about the distortions of the economy, the distortions of contemporary politics, the ways that value can be thought of differently. And one of these people, David Graeber, he has this nice quote.、Uh, kind of makes sense if you look at it, you think about it.、Uh, social systems are structures of creative action, right? And value is the importance that we place、uh, on the importance of those actions, right? This seems kind of okay, seems fine, except that this is not how value is normally portrayed. Right? This is not the idea. And yet, to me, it's very interesting to say, well, what are structures of creative action beyond the corporation, even beyond the classroom?、Right? How do we learn things、uh, that don't happen in the classroom? We've all experienced it.、Uh, and yet, we think of education often as being associated with school. There's ways, if we rethink of the varieties of social systems, the variety of values out there, we may be able to see new kinds of things. And this is one of the things I experienced、uh, when it came to. Seeing the work of making animation.、Uh, that as I spent time in anime studios,、uh, 
Uh, this, I, I was at Anime Boston recently. It's a big, one of the big fan conventions uh, in Boston. And uh, this director, uh, Tomohiko Ito, was there, the director of Sword Art Online. I'm sure some of you know uh, this recent uh, TV series. Uh, and it was an interesting moment when a fan asked a question. He said, uh, uh, Ito-san, uh, what's your favorite part of Sword Art Online? And I thought, yeah, that's a great question. I'm wondering, like, which scene, which level, which character, which fight, uh, which love scene uh, was his favorite? But Ito had a, had a really interesting answer. He said, well, let me think about that. First, there was the writing the storyboards, and then we did the drawings, and then the voice recording, then the editing. Yeah, I liked it all. Yeah, I liked all those parts of it. <laughs> and the fans were there scratching his head going, that wasn't the answer I was looking for. Uh, uh, and yet, what it does is it highlights how different our perspective can be, right? That as a producer and as a fan, we can have a very different uh, understanding of what anime even is. Uh, I did some field work. Gonzo Studios is one of the places I did field work, watching the making of a TV series called Red Garden. Anybody seen Red Garden out there? All right, a few people, way to go. It didn't get that big, it's true. Uh, but it's kind of interesting. I got to sit in these script meetings week after week. Um, it's a story of, um, I, you know, it's, it's that usual thing, sort of five zombie schoolgirls in New York City, you know, fighting monsters. Uh, uh, you can imagine, probably. Uh, anyway, that was, the, that was the series being made, um, and it was fascinating. I mean, it was fascinating to see them hashing out the story uh, week after week. And one of the things that struck me, uh, because this was an original anime not based on a comic book story already, uh, that they were still working out the story, but what they had defined were the characters and the world in which they lived. The world was New York City, but there was also fighting monsters and they were zombies, and it was a little more complicated than just New York City, uh, but that was the idea. Uh, and it reminded me that in the making of Japanese animation, there was much more about the characters and the worlds that come first, and then the story can be spun off in a bunch of different directions. And this was something I saw over and over uh, in the process of seeing anime made. But the other interesting thing is I finally talked myself into being able to see these background spaces where the people actually work. And I got to spend some days just sitting around as they were drawing. Uh, took, them a long, took me a long time to talk them into this, because they said, it, it's so boring. You know, why would you, why would you want to sit there? I said, well, you know, for us, it's not boring. It's just fascinating. We it, never get to see this side of it. Uh, and I was kind of struck going backstage, because when I interviewed the CEO of this company, and that's how I was able to get, uh, talk him into letting me see some of this uh, production being made, he said, you know what makes Gonzo different? We are digital. And in a way, they were more digital in other places, but this is also the look of Anime Studios, right? It's paper. They're drawing on paper. Uh, here we have the director, Matsuo, uh, writing out the storyboards on paper. We have the animation director here checking uh, the drawn images with her eraser and her pencil, and she's checking it against character sketches. Uh, and this was the kind of process uh, by which Japanese animation is still made. Uh, there's a team of six people. This is the uh, character designer's desk, uh, a woman named Fuji Jun. Uh, her work was already done. And again, this is kind of symbolic. She had already designed the characters. So she wasn't around most days. I got to sit at her desk. Uh, and this was the space uh, where the team of six people, the core group, making the animation worked. Uh, you can sort of see here the director, the computer uh, graphics guy. Inside that little curtained off area, that's the color area. There's always one of these curtained off areas where they have several different kinds of screens there, a computer screen, several TV screens, in order to try to uh, balance the variation of colors that come out depending on different technologies. Uh, and over here, you have a guy painting the backgrounds uh, with paint on paper. Uh, that was still part of the process. The character designer woman's desk and the animation director's desk, another woman. Uh, and that was the six people. And then once they made the keyframes, or once they had the storyboards, they would farm it out to keyframes. The keyframes would be farmed out to the in-between framers, uh, often in South Korea. I mean, one of the interesting things about Japanese animation is about 90% of the frames are actually drawn overseas. Uh, South Korea, Philippines, Taiwan. Not Taiwan so much for uh, uh, Japan. Taiwan's more for the US. Uh, but mostly South Korea, a lot of these studios work with. Um, it's also actually part of the history of Japanese animation as well, that American animation studios used Japan as an outsourcing uh, center, uh, especially in the 70s uh, and around then. Okay, kind of interesting. And even though the technology uh, of making animation has changed, I got a tour of Toei Animation, she showed me uh, these treasures. She said, you know, these are treasures now, I know, uh, but we're going to have to throw them out. Um, 
uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of unbelievable, but that's, that's the way they do it. Um, uh, now it's more uh, technology, more on computers, uh, but there's still these spaces uh, of painting, of hand-drawn work uh, that's still very much part of the scene. Uh, I got to see Tekong Kingcrete uh, being made a little bit as well. Uh, I saw some of the voice recording studios. This is one of the voice recording studios I visited. This is what Tokyo looks like. This is Western Tokyo where a lot of these studios exist and a lot of them are spread out in kind of small buildings there. Uh, Japan Viz Tech there uh, is the uh, voice recording studio uh, that I visited once. Uh, here's another one uh, centered in Shinjuku. And it was interesting to see uh, this kind of business where people were not making a lot of money, right? They were barely getting by, but they were getting by enough and they believed in the project. They wanted to be part of this art form. They were excited about it. And there was a kind of social energy uh, that grew out of being part of a group that was committed to something. And I was really struck by that, because it's not something I think I would have been able to experience if I hadn't been sitting in those rooms for hour after hour trying to understand what kept them going. And I remember sitting in this studio in particular, this is the voice recording for Red Garden, and seeing uh, a young woman there, a young voice actress, waiting for her big chance. Uh, and she was just there to observe, to see how it was done. There were a few real stars uh, who were there, and they were getting a lot of attention and being treated like the divas that they were. Um, in a good way, I mean, I think that's okay. <laughs> uh, but I could see in this young actress's eyes uh, that she wanted to be up there too, that she was reading along with the script, imagining the day when she would have her chance. And you could feel that kind of buzz of excitement, of anxiety and excitement. And I know this was happening because I felt it too, right? I was like, yeah, that looks kind of cool. I wish I could be up there, you know, uh, having my chance as a voice actor. Uh, and then a crazy thing happened. The sound director says, turns to the director and says, we need an extra. You want to do it? And the director says, no, let's get Ian to do it. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm in the studio. I can't believe it. I got my thing. I got my lines. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to do it. I'm, I'm fumbling over my lines. I, you can see how nervous I look. <laughs> I am nervous. Uh, it's my big chance, my debut uh, as a voice actor. Uh, and I got to show you, you know, I got to show you what it is. So uh, uh, I know it's tooting my own horn, that's the way it goes, but here it is. So here we are, a scene in Red Garden. Um, what's the episode number? I can't even remember. Episode 11. And uh, the scene is these uh, two of the high school girls, one of them are walking around New York. One of them is looking for her lost father, her long lost father. So they're going around. They think, oh, this might be it. They, they knock on a door. Um, and you'll be able to figure out who I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my big moment. Uh, <laughs> I'm the sketchy guy upstairs. Uh, so anyway, you know, it's symbolic of all sorts of things, I suppose. Uh, but, um, but one of the things that it also reminded me, you know, is, is that there's all this labor, right? That media is not just about the content on screen. Uh, it's about a whole process. And that industry itself is not just about the things that are made, the things that are bought and sold and that we add up as GDP. It's about human beings. It's about people working, about people trying to work on a problem that's bigger than themselves. Uh, and that there's all sorts of examples within the world of animation of work that's done that's never seen on screen. I mean, this is just a whole uh, ta table worth of sketches that are used for Tech on King Greet just to get ideas, to just get the feel for different possibilities for scenes. Most of them never used, uh, but still they're part of the process. And this is kind of metaphorical, it seems for me, uh, for how things actually get done. Um, and even when we saw, the, I saw the end of uh, Tech on King Crete being made here, uh, and I remember seeing this incredible graph on the, on the wall there. I said, what's this? They said, well, this is um, how much work we've done and how much work we still have to go. And all the red parts filled in uh, are parts of the film that have already been finished uh, and the white parts are the part that's still going to have to be done. I'm like, well, what, what are the black parts? So those are the parts we cut <laughs> because we didn't have time and we ran out of money. Um, and, and here's the director, Michael Aris, actually an American guy directing it in this Japanese anime studio. And he said, you know, I'd, I'd heard of this. Uh, from Mamoru Ishi, Oshi, uh, the director of one of the uh, early uh, Ghost in the Shell movies. And he said, Oshi said, that's, that's what it's going to be like. You know, when you get to the end, you have your child there 
uh, and you have to decide whether to cut off an arm or a leg. <laughs> so that's a pretty gruesome image. He says, yeah, but it feels just like that. Uh, and again, it's kind of an example of all the work uh, that goes into making animation, right? And this is what it is, stacks of paper piling up day after day that people have to get through on a deadline. And even just that top folder right there, if you can see, it says episode five, cut number one, six seconds. <laughs> That's six seconds worth of the final film. And so what this does is, is remind us that there's always this labor aspect. In fact, animation reminds us of the massive labor involved in making especially cartoons. And part of the history of this, I talk about this more in the book, so I'm just going to go through it some, somewhat quickly, is that one of the ways Japanese animation got through this incredible amount of labor was by cutting corners. Uh, and one of the big early examples of this was Astro Boy or Tetsuan Atomu, Mighty Atom, uh, one of the earliest uh, it was certainly the earliest regular TV series based on a, a Tezuka manga, um, Osamu Tezuka. Uh, uh, and it used the story that was already there, and they made very limited animation. Barely three frames were drawn per second of film. It was very herky-jerky kind of animation. For the people who were making animation before that, uh, people like Otsuka Yasuo, uh, who were inspired by Disney and the beauty of films like Bambi, Snow White, uh, and so on, uh, they thought this was an abomination uh, to animation, the beauty, the art of full animation. This was such limited animation. And yet, Astro Boy was hugely popular. And it set in motion a kind of style of making animation uh, that hinged on first having uh, a comic book character, a comic book series that became hugely popular, making uh, animation on the cheap and selling toys uh, to go with it. Uh, and it's this kind of nexus of production that really characterizes Japanese animation and helps explain why, even though animation doesn't make much money, it can become a phenomenon. And part of it is because once we read the manga, we watch the anime, we own the toy, uh, that it becomes something that we can show off to our friends. And it has a kind of cachet uh, that helps us understand why even these toys become part of a bigger world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, right? And who is the boy holding that up to? His friend who doesn't have one. <laughs> Are you going to share it or not share it? That's what I want to know, right? Uh, and, and so it becomes interesting. This kind of story comes up over and over again and through the course of Japanese animation history. Uh, the Gundam, the famous series Gundam, was initially deemed a complete failure. It was canceled early by the original sponsor because the toys were not selling. Uh, and yet what happens is a small company at that time called Bandai uh, is making light plastic models. Uh, they license the model rights because the other company that originally sponsored the film or the TV series uh, didn't make plastic models. Uh, Clover was the name of them. Uh, and these plastic models go crazy, right? P fans build the models. Uh, and also, there's a growing fan community that's happening this time. New magazines are coming up based on fan articles and fan reviews that get written in. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Even this is 1979, 1980, user-generated content is already having a big impact. User-generated content is not unique to the Internet age. Uh, it's been going on and going on. And in fact, I think there's a way that we could look back on the history of media uh, and see this kind of role uh, for fans as well. And that it's kind of social dynamics that lead to the success of Gundam, which is then revived and becomes uh, one of the leading series in Japan, still being remade today. Uh, here's an example of what the, uh, uh, the models look like. I'm still working on this model. I'm almost done, though. <laughs> I'm almost done. Um, and it points up sort of another aspect of media studies that I learned sort of studying the history of Japanese comic books and comic books more generally. Uh, the Scott McCloud writes this wonderful stuff analyzing how comic, book work, comic books work. Uh, and he talks about the gutter. And he has this really nice quote. He says, the gutter is that space uh, between the frames. Uh, and he says, this, this space, uh, the gutter, plays host to much of the magic and mystery at the very heart of comics. Uh, he says, this magic and mystery uh, depends on someone else, too. And he, I quote, Every act committed to the page by the comics book's artist is aided and abetted by a silent accomplice, you, the reader, an equal partner in crime. 
I may have drawn the ax being raised, uh, but I'm not the one who decided how it fell, how hard it fell, or why. That, dear reader, was you. <laughs> and it's an interesting concept, it seems to me, because it points to the idea that it may not be the content of the media itself so much as what happens in the space between the media and ourselves that matters. Uh, and I think we can see this uh, in the m manga industry as well. Uh, it's a huge industry. Uh, I, I make this argument that, or I draw on this argument that others have made that manga is unique because it offers a very democratic approach to success. Why? Because it's not easily affected. The success of a certain manga is not affected by marketing. It's more affected because, by the people who read it. And because it's so easy to access. It's virtually free to access. Um, there's also uh, many ways in which fan artists, there's a huge group of people. The largest convention in all of Japan is Comic Market, where over three days, a half a million people, a half a million people get together to buy and sell fan-made comic books uh, that use copyrighted characters without permission. <laughs> the manga industry does not like it. They think it's a disaster, but it's also too big a crowd uh, to fight with, and they've given up on fighting it. Um, uh, and meanwhile, right, the manga publishers also listen to the readers. They get, the big publishers get 4,000 postcards a week looking at their selection of manga, that, and each manga each week will have about 20 stories in it. They say, well, what were the three best and what were the three worst? The three worst start working their way out, and, uh, and the ones who are best, like these kinds, are the kinds that have beat out the competition year after year. It's a very competitive uh, and has a very interesting feedback loop uh, as an industry of media. Why didn't this happen in the US? Kind of interesting question. We had a very powerful comic book industry in the US in the 1940s uh, and beyond. But in 1954, America fell for junk science. Uh, there was a psychiatrist uh, who said, comic books are destroying our youth. Uh, there were congressional hearings. Uh, and the publishers freaked out. And they set up this comics code to say, comic books from now on can only be for children. Uh, and we got less Tales of the Crypt. Uh, and more masked Avengers. Uh, and it really sort of set in motion a big, uh, a big split between the evolution of Japanese comics uh, and American comics, uh, which might help us rethink uh, the kind of role of fans today. Uh, fan subs, very controversial, uh, and certainly a space that's changing uh, as new, uh, more legitimate uh, forms of uh, uh, access are out there. Uh, but I think it's also, for me, I think it's interesting to think about the ethics of fan subbing and the way it argues there should be different models for copyright sharing uh, and collaboration. Okay. Cosplay, another fascinating space around uh, using characters in new ways. Uh, anime music videos, something I'm quite fascinated in as well. Uh, and these kinds of social dynamics can help us not only understand anime, uh, but the kinds of interactions that happen in online gaming as well, often among strangers, but strangers we develop relationships with. And so I'll end with the idea that there is, like in the age of Windsor McKay, right, groups of people who gather, not only at Comic Market, but the groups that come together, so each of these tables, so there's about 33,000 people, 33,000 fan groups, many more apply than that, but 33,000 are accepted. And each day, a different group of about 11,000 groups come in uh, and try to sell their wares. Um, and the question is, why do they do it? Most of them don't make money. Uh, in fact. But they do it for other reasons, kind of social reasons. Uh, and I think this kind of survey that was done about why people go to comic market, why people participate in this fan-made comic world, even though it's not about money, right? even though they're unlikely to get rich, uh, that they like making the works. It's satisfying. And although it says making works is fun, also I think it's fun because they do it among their friends. Right? They have a community around them that cares. Uh, and then they like showing it to others as well. Um, this is interesting because the founders of Comic Market said, well, we need to make Comic Market because artists need a space to express themselves in ways they wouldn't be allowed to because of copyright law, and we're going to make that space. Uh, but it turns out that that's pretty da far down the list uh, of what matters as a kind of art activity or as a form of expression. The manga publishers hate it because they say this is our characters being used to make money. But that's also not the motivation uh, for what's driving this. Again, it's something else. And what this points to, to me, uh, is that there's ways in which to think about collaborative creativity that's different than an industry. Uh, it's even different than a singular, single media form. That there's something about the social energy that people put into this that drives us day to day to do things that may or may not only make money. 
Um, and that's, what I, that's one of the ways I use this word, the soul of anime, that we put our social energy into these media worlds. The characters and worlds, right, become a way of thinking about this movement across media forms. It's not just stories that move, but characters move, and they can become part of us uh, as we dress up as characters or as we draw them ourselves. Uh, and the cultural action, right, the kinds of change that can bring about new ways of doing things may happen across categories of producers. It's not a world of producers and consumers, but the consumers are kind of producers, and producers have to learn to be consumers uh, as well. And it may be that this kind of thinking may give us some ideas for overcoming the unfortunate grip of the negative sides of capitalism and recognizing that there's new forms of connectivity can offer us new possibilities for transforming the world in ways we may not yet have even imagined. Thank you very much. That's it. <laughs> let's have some questions. Let's have some discussion. Uh, let's, start, uh, let's start over here, and then we'll come over. Uh, Could I ask you to introduce yourself, too, and say something you're interested in? Oh, my name is Josh Schwartz. I'm a literary studies engineer. Thank you. Um, I like looking at global perspectives. Given how the US and Japan economies have stagnated, but that Hollywood AAA titles see less and less original titles each year. Less and less what? Less and less AAA titles. OK. They, they production Mm -hmm. Will this pattern affect Japan's anime industry in the next 10 or 20 years? Or any kind of yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of concern about the animation industry, certainly. Uh, and one of the concerns is that as in, you know, in the years when Hayao Miyazaki and, and the other uh, directors of today were getting their start, they had a lot of opportunity to draw in between frame stuff. Uh, and practice and practice and practice, get faster and faster and better. And that kind of training sort of gave them an opportunity uh, to, uh, I'm coming around to your question, but this is sort of one of the ways they're thinking, the animators are thinking about the, the threats to the industry. So what, now that those in-between frames are mostly being done overseas, the people who are becoming animators have to learn in school. Uh, and there's a concern that uh, they may not be getting sufficient training for it. Um, I think that that kind of concern about how you think of the pipeline of expertise uh, and skill building uh, is probably more of a concern to the industry than the big hits, you know, and whether AAA titles will be big or not so big. Uh, most Japanese animation studios have been able to get by without them, uh, often through selling DVDs, another market that's facing real big challenges right now. Um, but uh, I do think that uh, change is underway. I, my sense, however, and this is sort of would be my prediction, is that uh, because there's still a huge manga market uh, and that animation in Japan is so dependent on and building upon the platform of manga, if you will, uh, that they should still do okay. Uh, and that to me, you know, if I'm saying, okay, so what, what does this mean for the future of media, right? How does this suggest a direction to go forward? It seems to me that, that maybe the key is having a democratic base and maybe democratic is the wrong word, but a participatory space uh, like this comic market, like this fan-made production, where people get that training. I, I think it's happening less in animation. It's certainly happening in the manga world through this fan activity. Uh, and it seems to me that's what we're starting to see with musicians, right? Thinking Kickstarter-type models, right? Thinking of fan-based, uh, finding money for investors. Uh, and that's a kind of bottom-up support for new kinds of creativity. It seems to me we're seeing the possibility for that all over the place. Uh, it's a very different model uh, than the big studio style. I don't think the big studios will go away. I think their opportunities may shrink. They're not going to go away. But I think a lot of the new innovation is going to come by reimagining that kind of participatory space. Thanks. There was a question over here, too. Yeah, um, I'm Susan Chizek. Yeah. I teach here. But my daughter is a big anime fan. And, but one of my students wrote a paper that the everyone in the anime industry is sort of overworked and underpaid and is all outsourced and therefore the creativity was draining away and it was much more hackneyed and the storylines weren't as good and you've commented on that somewhat. Yeah, it's a concern. It's a concern and it's, you know, I, I, as I read the history of 
anime and, and see how people have been talking it back in the you know, 60s and the 70s, it's actually a complaint that's been around a long time. <laughs> so that makes me wonder, you know, I, I do think it's a difficult industry. I think a lot of industries are difficult too. So it, it's hard to know uh, if things are getting worse. Uh, I do think it is a hard time for these package, these kinds of media forms that depend on a package, right? The DVD is really where the money was made. Uh, uh, or you know, TV broadcast and commercials where now you can just download it for free without the commercials if you want. Uh, it's a real challenge. Part of me still says though that if there's an interest in it, you know, and it, it, if we as fans uh, take more responsibility for the support of the industry, uh, then there's a chance uh, to, to turn it around. I mean, I guess that's sort of one of, my, one of the things I would pass along is that I, you know, I went through the 90s and seeing the music industry in Japan and they were the, 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 the peak of the million selling albums and these huge hits. It was just never reached the reach peak like it did in the 1990s. And it was a time when the big record companies could be trusted to bring up a bunch of the younger bands. And they would try them out. Most of them would fail, uh, but they would try them out. That time is gone. But for those of us who care about manga or anime or music, uh, it means it's our turn to step up. Uh, and that might be, I think, you know, for, as college students, maybe you don't have the money to, uh, to pay much for music or for anime. Uh, me now, I make a point of paying for it. <laughs> you know, the, the, there can be a, sort of a life cycle to it. And there can be other forms of participation besides paying for it, it seems to me. And so th I think for those of us who are concerned about exactly this question, it's important for us to take a more active role uh, for trying to think of how we can be part of the solution rather than lamenting. Uh, the loss of this old age, which again, I'm not sure is coming back. I think, it, I don't, you know, 10 years ago, they, with Napster coming out, they predicted the end of music, that no one, everyone would stop making music. Well, it just, we knew it was stupid back then, and it turns out now we have proof. Uh, it's just not true. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's not a struggle to be a musician. Um, and it does mean that we fans have to step up. And, and the nice thing is, now there's the opportunity. You know, maybe I can only step up for five bucks, but five bucks in the Kickstarter campaign times 50,000 people, all of a sudden that's about the budget people were getting uh, from a bigger record company anyway. So, I don't know, but that's my sense. Yeah, please, right up here first, and then we'll come back. Okay, um, so with... Can you introduce yourself there? Oh, I'm, I'm Becky. I'm a geology master's student who also draws comics, which is fun. Great. Uh, and so my question was, with the increasing popularity of manga just here in the U.S., there's also a growth of a lot of new comic artists making their own homegrown American manga. And how do you see this playing a bigger role in the U.S. comics business? Because currently, it's just a tiny portion of the overall United States, just comics. But uh, I think there's possibility. I mean, I don't know. You see, I mean, I'm sure it's the true here as well, but my students, you know, they're talking about web comics uh, as much as they're talking about something they would buy at the store. Uh, and and that the, it's clearly can have a big impact. And, you know, I do think the internet's a big deal, <laughs> frankly, and, uh, and not just in a negative way, right, for media, that, that it is opening new possibilities. And I don't think the only question is how to monetize it. I do already uh, sense, and I'm sure you sense as well, uh, the idea that building an audience first and then thinking about money later is probably the way to go. Uh, and I think now there's that possibility. I think there was a time when until the companies were convinced they could make a lot of money, they wouldn't promote something. But now you can throw up your web comics on a, a website and throw your hat in the ring, right? Uh, it's, it's competitive, but I think there's, there's a chance. There was one here, and then we'll start working our way across here, too. Oh, uh, yeah, Please. I was um, going to ask about uh, the, the, the US uh, seems to have a stricter copyright laws. I mean, in, in uh, Japan, you're talking about how they had these um, conventions where, where you could go and, and uh, buy um, fan-made uh, mangas with existing characters, but if you try to do something like that here, you could probably get arrested and things. And would you say that this is a bad thing for media overall? Yes. I mean, that's, uh, the, the, one of the things is, uh, there are a couple things in there. One is that actually copyright law is virtually the same in both places. What's different uh, both in Japan and the U.S. and that uh, it's just as illegal in Japan as it is in the U.S. What's different is the enforcement of it. 
Uh, I think this is changing a little bit slowly. Uh, and, and so um, I don't know what's going to happen with copyright. I do think that copyright alone uh, is not the solution uh, to media industry challenges. However, I'm, I also do think that artists should have some control over the uses of their work. So I, I, I mean, it's, it's going to have to be, if not case by case, at least uh, an ongoing back and forth process where we have to acknowledge you know, that the people who make this stuff have poured their heart into it. Uh, and that for us to just take it and then turn it into our own thing, you know, is, there are some artists who say that's OK. Gundam was one of the examples of that, by the way. I mean, Gundam, when people started making this fan-made work, uh, and, and the reporters were challenging the Gundam producers and saying, look, you see what they're making? You know, look, they made up a whole encyclopedia and timeline of this universe that you didn't make. What do you think about that? And the Gundam producers said, might be that way. You know, they didn't fight it, actually. And it really energized the fans to say, OK, you know, this is, this is a space where we're allowed to play, too. Uh, and in, the, in retrospect, it was genius. Um, and so I think there's different models. I, I think it's important for writers and creators to be able to have some say over how their stuff is used. Um, I don't know how far that extends. And I think we're going to have to find a middle ground. You know, I think about hip hop and sampling. How does it work with, with music sampling? Right now, there already is, it seems to me, a two tier system. Um, if you're Jay Z or Kanye West or Childish Gambino, you've got to pay for those samples, <laughs> okay, because you're making money. Uh, but if you're an independent artist uh, who's barely scraping by, then maybe you get to use them. And once you get big, then you've got to start paying. I mean, there's already kind of this two tiered system in place. Maybe that's a model we could think about for some visual art as well. What else? We had some questions over here. Please. And don't forget to introduce yourself, please. My name is Steve Chang, and uh, I've been a professor here in the process class. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Grace has mentioned there's like, during the early days of animation, uh, there's a sort of feedback loop between Japan, uh, Japanese studios, and American studios, where you know, the styles are kind of traded back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if it's because we're living in a time that we're not aware of it, with you know, 2020 vision looking back. But where would you say this cycle of uh, Influences is that right now? Because there's shows like Quora, which we think of anime, even though it's kind of produced for US audiences. And then there are other shows we think of as cartoons, like, you know, Adventure Time or the regular show, versus what we feel Japanese anime. Do you think the two branches are kind of deviating from each other? Or do you expect, you know, there to be more conversion where, where a US audience becomes one? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I don't know. I mean, I think part of, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's hard to do this kind of prediction. I mean, I think one one of the things I would say is that uh, it's true in the U.S. It's true in Japan as well. That there are some things the U.S. produces that's very popular and watched in Japan, and other stuff that isn't. I mean, my anime friends in Japan just do not get South Park. They're like, what? They're like, what could possibly be funny about that show? We have no idea. I'm like, no, it's really funny, actually. But you know, it's, it's hard to explain that. Um, they can get The Simpsons a little more, right? And I think there's a whole range of stuff that's made in Japan that just doesn't make it over here, too. We have to realize there's like 100 different anime series running every year uh, in Japan. Say a ton of those get fan subbed. What are we talking, 30, 40 of them, right? A third, probably. And of those, probably, you know, is it five or 10 that really get watched? Right, so the, in general, my sense of the media world is that they, media worlds is they tend to be much bigger than we imagine. Um, and so that it's a little dangerous just to go by on what's popular in terms of what the whole scene is. And I think that's true of all the US and all the Japan. Um, I, I do think that, that I've been surprised, or I was surprised in doing my research, that the Japanese animators are less trying to target an American audience for the most part, that they're trying to make their money in Japan, and then if they can make a little extra in the US, that's great. But that they see it as risky to try that otherwise. Um, so we'll see. I mean, so if my theory is right, here's the one last thing I could say. If my theory is right, then the, the groups or the anime or manga or comic styles that are more open, that are more shareable, that make a space for this kind of participation, uh, succeed, then I'm right. <laughs> if it's people who say, no, we got to copyright, hold it down, lock it down, make money, become a business, and do it, if they're the ones who end up being the ones succeeding, then I'm wrong. And, and I think it'll be interesting to see. And I don't, I'm not very good at this prediction thing. Uh, I would add, though, that the professionals in the business are not very good at it either. 
<laughs> uh, and that the way they do it is by trying a bunch of stuff and hoping that enough of it succeeds to pull themselves forward. That's a good question. Thank you. Please. Um, I'm planning on a biology major, and I'm also a doctor of medicine in Dr. Dawson's class. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, because we talked about in the class, that anime is made to by Japanese and Oh, they love it. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anybody who, you know, doesn't appreciate a slightly bigger audience <laughs> in this business anyway. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it's very exciting. I mean, I do think that some of the producers are a little mystified. They don't always know what's going on. Certainly they don't know. It's hard for them to predict what's going to be the big hit overseas. It often seems to take them by surprise. Uh, has been my experience. Um, and I don't have, you know, I haven't had a lot of interactions with lots of creators, but I have had Mamoru Hosoda come to uh, MIT a couple, a few times now. Uh, and I, I know he's just ecstatic, you know, and he'll sit there and sign for hours. And it's just, it's again, it's like that kind of social edge. It's exhausting for him, but he also doesn't want to let it go. So um, I don't think, they, they don't make a distinction necessarily. You know, they don't think like, oh, I really need Japanese fans. If I only have overseas fans, it's bad. No, you take anybody. <laughs> like teachers that way. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Um, I'm obviously Japanese. Yeah. Okay. Um, what kind of influence do you think that anime has on the No, no, I think, I think I see what you're driving at, and I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. No, you, you've hit on, in, in fact, I think one of the, the big philosophical questions about the impact of media. You know, is it better to have some big concept that really makes us rethink the world and imagine new futures and it's, uh, you know, far-reaching in its goals? Um, and, and I think the assumption is, in the traditional art interpretation view, that, yeah, that's better. Um, I'm not entirely convinced. You know, I, I think there's, there, that's fine, and, and I get lulled into or interested in that kind of big concept, high concept approach to media. Uh, uh, but I'm, I also like sometimes, you know, inappropriate rap songs. You know, and, and I, you know, I don't, I, I don't really want to have to justify it either. You know. I, <laughs> I just think they're funny, and I, I think there's something about it that's still okay, and, and maybe, and sometimes they make me think as much as, you know, that socially conscious stuff that's beating me over the head with the right way to think, and, and so, um, you know, you, I mean, I don't have a good answer, but I think you, what you've hit on is exactly a really interesting issue, which is the legit, legitimacy and authority of uh, the high culture really outweigh some of the other things, and 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 what, and that's the general. I think that's the generally agreed upon, at least publicly agreed upon approach. But I I tend to say I, I also like the people who say no 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 you know South Park is the pinnacle of America you know or something and, and you, 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 I kind of scratch my head. But then if, if you think you know, there might be a way to make that argument, uh, or even Adventure Time, you know, is Adventure Time so bad? No, I think it's kind of funny, you know. <laughs> and, 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 maybe, and maybe that tells us something about where we're at or how we use television or how, what we talk about. Or, um, I, I just think there's a lot of uses for media. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm leery of always looking for the correct political reading. Although I, I like that stuff too. So um, that's a non-answer. 
<laughs> it's a non-answer except to say that you're asking the right question and, it, and there's going to be a lot of different answers to it. Um, and, and my answer is that, yeah, some of that, that lower down stuff actually could be really insightful. Uh, and that's why we watch it. I, I had one producer I met in Japan uh, and he's like, you know, uh, anime is like junk food. It's like nobody respects it, but everybody wants to eat some. <laughs> and so that's why I was like, yeah, you know, junk food too, that's right, you know. No more vegan for me, you know. <laughs> we have time for one last question. How are we doing? Yeah. We're, we're starting to get close, but we've got time for one more question. And then uh, Dr. Condrick will hang around for the students who brought their textbooks. He's going to be signing books outside afterwards. And we'll be happy to stay as late as people want to talk. Right? Yeah, and if you have more questions, I'm happy to take them afterwards. Is there one more now? Here's one over here, please. Dr. Rajanabi. <laughs> It's a great question. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I have a good answer for it. I, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently, uh, I mentioned it briefly in the book, but I'm, I'm writing it about it a little bit more now, uh, is this phenomenon of Miku, this virtual idol uh, in Japan. And she starts as a voice synthesizer uh, uh, software. Okay, So you type in the lyrics, and you can type in the voice, and, and the software makes her sing. And when they released this uh, voice synthesizer software in 2007, they also released a little cartoon to go with it. Uh, but it's just a software synth voice synthesizer company. They're not an anime company. They're not a record studio. So they said, well, of course, if you make songs with this, uh, they're your songs. And you can use this image, because we, we don't make uh, comic books or anime. And I'm trying to we'll come around to the, the answer here. But the, so. It takes years, okay? It takes years to catch on, but people start making their own songs with it. 100 songs, 1,000 songs, tens of thousands, 100,000 songs, more than that, start being posted online in the Japanese YouTube, Niko Niko Doga. Uh, and then other people start making uh, videos to go along with these songs, uh, often other people's songs. And it grows, and it grows, and it grows. Uh, and now it's become quite a phenomenon. There are some musicians getting quite wealthy, even, uh, making uh, this kind of music. Other video producers are now getting famous for making the background videos for some of these songs. Um, and now what's interesting to this for me is that it allows both of these things to happen. That the thing about Miku is it can be very personalized. You're making your very own song for Miku. Uh, it's as if you get to write a song for Lady Gaga and she will sing it, you know? <laughs> uh, and you can post it online and nobody will arrest you. Uh, and, and so that it's, it, it ends up being, so, so I guess what I see happening is the possibility uh, for this very personalized approach to production. And it may be you only have three or four fans who comment on it. Uh, and that gives you enough satisfaction to make another song. Uh, and that some of these people, it's a small fraction, uh, like all of these media success stories, it's a small fraction who get to go up to the top. 
But there, I, I think we need more a sense of the success at the middle, or even the success at the level of fans. And I guess that's, I use this, this term success, but again, kind of very businessy kind of word, success, innovation, collaboration, right? And I don't want to say the way we think about these is all wrong, uh, or that what we focus on is a tiny fraction uh, of what success might be. Um, and I think this Miku example, I think the way that people use these characters, I think the way fans can get a kind of satisfaction, even from a small level of success, uh, might offer us different ways of thinking about, well, where do we want to go? You know, maybe we, we're not all going to be Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, right? My dream of getting rich, rich, rich didn't come true. Uh, but you know what? It's okay. <laughs> you know? And maybe if there's satisfaction in other places, maybe that's success as well. I don't think the personalized future eliminates uh, the other things. And in fact, I, I think if, if we look at the kinds of, of artists who are successful, it's some combination of just digging deep inside yourself, but then also reaching a broader audience. And, and the magic and the mystery that makes that happen uh, is a question for the ages. And frankly, it's always being redefined, uh, depending on the, the era and the media form and the, the possibilities for communication. Um, so I'm kind of bullish on the future myself. Uh, and if we think of how we have new opportunities to connect, uh, new ways of imagining, tackling big projects that are larger than ourselves, I see it happening all the time. Uh, I don't see it being recognized enough uh, for the kind of potential it opens up. And I guess that's the bit I would try to share uh, with this humble little project that I'm in. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark, Dr. Henson, for this. Uh, I'll be outside and have you talk. Uh, any more questions you might have, thank you all for coming.